You're listening to We Deep in Media. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Deepen with Christina. I'm your host, Christina Weber, founder and CEO of We Deepen, Feminine Weapon, and also a certified professional love coach. If you haven't lately, go to wedeepen.com, check out the love club there. The love club, we have a group of 21 people who are the first members of the Love Club, which is a intimacy accelerator where a group of people who are currently single have joined a team. We are essentially teaming up to enliven our intimacy journeys and to relationship in community. These are people, again, who are currently single. They're ranging in age at this moment in time from 30 to 87. They're all growth minded conscious leaders. And the group, this group right now is on their fourth month going into their fifth month. We're about to accept new members into the love club. If you're listening right now, you're currently single. You might feel a frustration, a fatigue around dating apps. And you just know, you know that there is love available, available to you, an epic relationship, an epic love life. And when I say the word epic, I mean healthy, let's say. I mean healthy, exciting, fun, enlivening. So check out wedeepen.com. Hit the link that says Love Club. There's an application there. Go ahead and fill that out. You'll receive a message after to schedule an interview. And we'll tell you more about what it's like to be a part of the Love Club. I'd love to have you join us in there. Also, we'll continue curating social transformational experiences. I'm obsessed with love. So everything you find there is in alignment with creating more meaningful, loving relationships. I thoroughly believe it's the solution to all the world's problems. If we could better get along with each other and if our children were raised viewing healthy relationship role models, we're learning love, studying love. That's what we're doing in the love club together. Uh, And I would I pray that our children of the future get to evolve with us as our relationships get better. Most of us didn't grow up deserving healthy relationships. We highly believe that we can change all of that. Also, I mentioned being founder of Feminine Weapon, and I have to give a shout out to the POS community in Los Angeles led by Adelaide Rose and Megan Joy. Feminine Weapon has just reached raising over $100,000 for children of abuse, extreme poverty, and human trafficking to receive art, healing, and transformational programming. You know, there are 150 million orphans worldwide. There are 18 million children living without a single parent. And I thoroughly believe that we, you know, the conscious adults, conscious grownups get to band together to provide care and love for the world's children. And it's, you know, my guest and I, maybe, maybe we'll touch on this a little bit today because I'm sure he has thoughts, but universally, it's kind of interesting to consider how there is many people are challenged with fertility of getting pregnant and having children these days. Uh, There are sometimes, I know I have many people surrounded around me who are in their 30s or 40s and desire to be a parent, both men and women. This isn't just women craving to be parents. These are men craving to be parents too. And they haven't found a right partner to align with to have families. And I think that there's some type of spiritual um, aspect to it of like, huh, this is really interesting. There's all these children with, without, you know, without love, you know, or, or, you know, 
receiving minimal, minimal love, or they have limited access to resources. And then there's all these people that want children. Uh, sure, maybe this is a little bit woo woo, the idea of oneness, but we are one human family. And I do see how there is, you know, with the time that we're living, there is an, an openness now to, huh, Let's come together and let's shift. So I'm really grateful to the POS community and all the, the people around Arte More, which is the nonprofit that we um, support um, that is going to orphanages all around the world, including in the United States, to provide these children with greater resources and education and transformational programming. These are, you know, some of the, the transformational workshops that we've been receiving in conscious community, running to whether that be Tony Robbins or the Joe Dispenza workshops or uh, learning meditation, sound baths, the transformation workshops, watching TED Talks, studying relationships. We get to bring those to the kids. So check out wedeepen.com. And if you do enjoy this podcast, I would like to invite you to give it five stars, rate it, follow it, subscribe, never miss an episode, share it with a friend. It helps me continue to host this podcast and helps to bring more people into this web. And, you know, another thing that I want to add in with the Love Club is that it's including peer-to-peer -peer matchmaking. You know, we are, as we're relationshiping on a team, we are expanding our networks to also include each other and to go out in the world. And as we socialize, to think about, hmm, this person might be good for this person. This person might be good for this person. Uh, I, I think the matchmaking industry is pretty comical, uh, you know, to go to one person and be like, go find the love of my life and bring them to me. Um, I have been working in the field of love and relationships for a decade. And, you know, I'm currently in a, in a significant relationship and it's a journey. It's, you know, it's, it's, I, I do believe our, our intimacy journey this lifetime is our life's journey um, towards greater connection and towards greater love. And I wish I could say there is some yenta out there with a magic wand that could be like, and you and you be together. You will be perfect. Uh, you know, I just, that would be God. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. My guest today, Daniel McKenzie, we have known each other for a few years. Uh, Daniel and I first met in Los Angeles. There was a program that a mutual friend of us would run called Fred Talks. It was a spin on TED Talks. And a group right. of awesome people would gather at a unique home in Venice, California. And Daniel was a regular musician who would perform at these events and give some level of consciousness talk. He's a philosopher, an author, a counselor, um, supports many people um, in having living their best lives ever. Uh, Daniel, thank you for joining me on Deepen with Christina. It's so good to be in constant collaboration with you. I loved also too, we got to work together during the pandemic uh, when Daniel launched the Omega Male podcast. And I know you're still you know, hosting those episodes, they can find them on Spotify or anywhere they listen to podcasts. And I'm excited to dive into conversation with you today. Yeah, thank you. That was a very uh, generous introduction. And uh, interestingly enough, yeah, um, Steve Glenn is still doing those Fred talks on occasion. They're sort of sporadic, but still happening. And um, yeah, it's we've had really wonderful um kind of collaboration going on between us. I remember there was that I did a spot on Talk Nerdy to Me just before the pandemic, right, when we were still meeting in person. And I was so grateful to have uh, We Deep and Host kind of what became the think tank for my, or the, I called it the think and feel tank for uh, for the, what became the Omega Male podcast. So yeah, it's really always uh, inspiring to talk to you. And here we are once again. Here we are once again. And this conversation was seated because you wrote this article, Smile at Bullies and Other Life Hacks for My Nephew. And then the article goes on to say, the world you are inheriting comes with greater challenges and more exciting opportunities than previous generations have ever faced. 
Yes. <laughs> we are seeing evolu evolution right before our eyes. And there's also a lot of chaos that we are. Now we can see the chaos more so than ever before. So this this article was, was what you had sent to me and wanted to have a dialogue on it. Do you want to give a, a, a bit of a summary of this, of what you wrote about here? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I over the holidays, um, I saw um, a big part of my extended family, um, cousins and nephews and nieces and, you know, children of nephews and or children of cousins. And um, everyone had just celebrated the holidays, Christmas or whatever we were all doing in different places. So we came together just before New Year's and it was decided instead of doing a big present exchange and buying each other presents, wouldn't it be uh, fun to do something kind of more creative and meaningful. And so we were going to do a little thing on New Year's Eve. And so someone might write a poem for someone, someone might make a funny sculpture, or there were people knitting hats for each other. Um, and so I was assigned my, my cousin's son, who's basically like a nephew to me, very inspiring, uh, young kid, young man. And I, uh, so I sang a song for him, but also wrote, wrote this little collection of kind of proverbs, you know, little, I've always been attracted to these kind of Mark Twain, Benjamin Franklin, -y little tidbits about life, you know, whether it's roomy or, or whatnot. And, um, and so it sort of seemed like a s s relatively humble opportunity to kind of throw my hat in that ring and see if I could come up with some pithy life advice and maybe put a little uh, a little humor in there too. And then it became, um, it was pretty well received, uh, you know, in family, um, which is not, you know, you'd think that that'd be an easy audience, but not, not my family necessarily. But so I ended up uh, turning it into an article that was published um, first on uh, Substack and then by the Good Men Project. And, and it was, uh, I think, I guess in, in retrospect, it's an opportunity for me to, to try to say more succinctly uh, or express some of the broader ideas I've been having about life and self-development obviously omega mail my podcast has to do particularly with the the challenges and opportunities uh, facing men these days and since i was writing to a young man um it gave that focus but you know there are broader things that interest me about uh self-transformational work and healthy relationships and so it was kind of um it was good for me as i work on this book that i'm writing to kind of have almost a road map in terms of these little condensed um thoughts and i think the through line here uh more than anything else is a, is i'm realizing that to me healthy relationships and healthy well-being as a human being particularly as someone navigating this incredible world of uh, unprecedented opportunity and challenges is this concept of balance balance in all things finding um equilibrium in a world where we're constantly being pulled in many directions and often in two opposing directions. So I think um, anyone who checks out this article, it seems to be in, in many of the points kind of a reiteration of that. Balance above all else. Yeah, the, the whole balance thing. There's also the, the idea that balance is a myth. <laughs> like what... What is balance? Whose idea is that? Yeah, uh, I mean, balance, you could look back at your life at 100 years old and be like, okay, in 100 years, I was balanced. You know, I did five years here, 10 years there. Like what, are we looking for balance in every moment? Like what, what, what is even that, does that mean? I'd love to dig into that um, because I think it, it means different things in different contexts. Uh, you can look at it, like any other ideal, right? I mean, people always say, well, perfection is impossible, right? Like what's perfect, you know, life, the only perfection is embracing perfection. And I think the Japanese even have a term for um, celebrating the inevitable imperfection and things. I don't think, I'm not sure. I think it's wabi-sabi, but I'm not sure. Um, so don't quote me on that. But so there are, I think any ideal has an aspect of unattainability, right? You can't, you know, as a human being, we strive for unconditional love for all, you know, some people strive for that, right? It's, at least it's an ideal. Can I be unconditionally loving even in one relationship at all times? 
Probably not. Um, you might strive for honesty as an ideal. And does that mean that's that in, even in the even if you never tell a lie, is every single moment of your life where maybe you omit something in a conversation because it's uncomfortable, right? It's always, um, I think it's important to kind of distinguish ideals as ideals, meaning they might not have, there might not be an actual manifestation of them in real life that's possible to the degree of perfection, but it doesn't mean that they're not loaded with power, right? And so um, apply it to any ideal, um, transparency, compassionate communication, kindness. There's no person who's absolutely kind in every single second, but, but somebody who has decided spiritually that kindness um, is a very powerful or the best uh, disposition towards other people and other beings is going to probably manifest that a lot more in their life than someone who sort of likes the concept or not. I mean, you yourself said in your introduction that you believe love is the sauce, right? Love is the thing that will heal the world, the only thing that can heal the world. And for you, that meant in that moment, like cultivating healthy relationships and loving parenting, et cetera. Now, do you believe that you, that everyone can be like perfectly loving at all times? Probably not. But you do believe clearly that um, healthy love is what you said, right? You said, when I mean epic, I mean healthy. But that is something worth striving for. It's an ideal. So when I'm talking about balance, um, it's similarly an ideal. Does that mean that I, I imagine that I'm walking through life perfectly balanced in every aspect or that anyone can be? No. Um, but I think it applies to so many different things. I mean, you could just um, pick any one of the things uh, from the article. Like, here, here's, a, here's an easy one that's very uh, controversial because we're so politically polarized. But one of the things I wrote about was, um, I don't remember how I phrased it, but it's sort of like, neither be too conservative nor too liberal. Or be both. Explore both. Um, because the notion of conservativeness, the notion of conserving comes from the impulse to recognize things that are of value and making sure we hold on to those, right? It's sort of like um, you recognize that being um, respectful in a relationship is a good thing. I want to keep that. I'm not going to just throw that out, out the window. Um, and yet the, the notion of uh, liberalism, it has connected to freedom, right? Liberty, liberalism, or progressivism, which implies having progress, implies the notion of um, wanting to explore new things so that we can make the existing things better, right? And so if you think about these things just conceptually, not politically, but just conceptually, we, we need both of these impulses. We need to have an open-minded exploration of how we can make things better, whether as individuals or systemically, um, because that's the way things change. If we didn't have that, women still, still wouldn't have the right to vote. You know, uh, There wouldn't be equal rights, there wouldn't be civil rights. If people didn't go, hey, maybe the system that we have needs a little improvement. you know. And at the same time, if we didn't have kind of a conservative impulse to say, well, wait a minute, there are some things that are of value in our education system or in our family values, and let's let's hold on to those. Let's not like let go of those. So, so even though most people I know kind of identify as a liberal progressive or as a conservative, and they've joined these teams, as I see it, both of these impulses are important for life. You know, it doesn't matter who you end up voting for. So that's that's what I kind of what I mean about about cultivating balance and things. You know. Um, but it really applies. It applies to a lot of realms, and I and I and I'd be happy to explore um, in any context that you find interesting. Did you read the Andrew Huberman podcast or the Andrew Huberman article in the New York, the New Yorker, New York Magazine? I think it's New York Magazine. I don't think so. I don't think so. Which what was it about? Oh my god! I wish I would have sent that article to you before we started this podcast, uh, I think that would have been really interesting. Well, give, me, see if you can, give me the cliff notes and maybe we can. Uh... So an article was released in the in New York magazine about 
it's it's pretty much a takedown piece on Andrew yeah. Huberman. And he I don't know who this is, by the way. You got it, you might have to contextualize who Andrew Huberman is. Oh, interesting. Andrew Huberman is a huge podcaster. He is one of the top ten podcasts in the world. Um he's one of he's known as a, a big biohacker. Okay. Uh, I think six point five million followers on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, scientist from Stanford lives there in Topanga. I know you're in Los Angeles. He lives in Topanga. So live up and here. Um, a lot of people, you, tons of people, listen to his podcast, and he has supported a lot of people in thinking about life differently. He's actually one of the reasons why I don't drink alcohol pretty much at all anymore. And I don't smoke cannabis at all anymore. He broke, he has two episodes, one on alcohol and one on cannabis that he just broke down the effects of it on the the body and the brain. And I was like, I'm done with that. I think a lot of people can credit him for um, giving the information that it took for them to realize um, the negative effects and make changes in their life. I like them already. Yeah, I don't do any of that stuff either. So the piece is essentially he's been fucking up his relationships, his personal relationships. Um, One woman came forward that he dated for four or five years. Um, There is cheating allegations. Um, Now there are five women that are traveling together because they all discovered each other because Andrew was um, in intimate relationships with each of them. But... uh, having separate they didn't know about each other there was not a lot of transparency in that interaction also some of his friends or maybe they're not friends not quite sure um or also quoted in the article about him having a temper and he would be flaky and not always show up um, or keep his commitments um mm. he would say that he was uh, you know stuck at work or you know on a podcast and um and so this really long article uh, on him an expose took him down and i it's it's interesting to see how th- there's I, I i listened to a another podcast this morning as a woman um went through the entire article and you know makes the case okay great, this man has been messy in his personal relationships, but what does this have to do with his work? You know, this is clearly a takedown piece and um, something to um, invalidate a professional. Mm. I find, you know, it to be a little bit of, um, it's definitely messy. Um, Do... Do our personal lives need to be aired in the public eye, um, especially when you become a public figure? You do become a role model. And I do think that we are seeking as a society to formulate secure attachment, let's say secure attachment with each other. Mm -hmm. I also think this is interesting to bring up because in your article, one of the things that you said to your nephew was don't confuse sex and love. Mm -hmm. And yes, we all desire unconditional love, but relationships have condition. And in being a public figure, that comes with a level of power. Um, And, uh, you know, when we want to use our power, you want to see people with power to be acting in kindness, but we're all necessarily not going to agree on what that is. For example, a mother of an obese child is you might appear that she's loving her child because she's feeding her child. And if she was to withhold food from him and him to whine because he wants a specific type of food and he's upset and he's not giving them the type of food, well, you could say, well, that's actually real love but it's messy and it looks mean. It doesn't look kind at times. Well, there's so, there's so much in, 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 uh, in this example that you've brought up. And so I'll try to sort of skip around at some of the, some of the points you're, you're, you're raising. So there's the point about privacy. What, uh, 
to what degree do people who are in the public eye owe the public the details of their private lives? Do they deserve some level of privacy? What's the line, right? Famously recently, um, you had this thing in the royal family, right? Where Kate Middleton is now, uh, it's now been relieved she has cancer and she's dealing, dealing with cancer. But there was a lot of sort of prurient interest from the tabloids about, oh, Kate's missing and what's going on. And this, you know, it was all about, you know, is is her, is uh, the prince having an affair? And there's this other woman. And like it turned out, they were just trying to be private about her cancer. And then a lot of the tabloids felt bad about that. So there's so there's an interesting question there in terms of like, you know, why, you know, to what degree is it everybody's business, you know, what Sean Puffy Combs, you know, is being sued for or whatever, you know. Um, and so when, you know, there are various ways of uh, uh, addressing that. I think what makes this particular case uh, more specific is you're talking about somebody who's not just a public personality, but presumably someone who is sharing ideas about how to live life in a healthy way, right? And so I don't know, since I'm not familiar with him, I haven't heard his podcast. If he's just talking about helping people get sober or helping people, you know, to organize their day in a particular way or to be more productive or to be creative, that really has little to do with how healthy his personal relationships are. And one person might care a ton about that and another person might not care a ton about that. I remember there was, um, well, now I am skipping around, but it was, it was interesting to me at some point when I came back to LA, I joined an online group uh, on Facebook it was like at Los Angeles vegetarians and vegans. And I thought it was just like, oh, this way I'll find out some new vegetarian restaurants because I'm vegetarian, I'm not vegan. But there was a political element in there um, and that flared up almost immediately that I thought was interesting. There, the, the, there was a kind of a militancy in the group um, and there was controversy because the owners of a popular vegan restaurant had been revealed to have like, they, had, they were also farmers and they had this big farm somewhere and I guess they had this old cow and as this cow had gotten older, they decided, well, maybe we should slaughter it and use its meat, you know? And these were the people that started a vegan restaurant. And of course, the vegan contingent was totally up in arms about this. And they were they were staging boycotts of the restaurant. And it was this very absolutist way of like trying to hold, a, you know, an ostensibly public people accountable. And I think they figured, oh, well, you're hypocrites. You, you have a vegan restaurant, but you slaughtered a cow. And I think the people responded with, look, we never said that we are now eternally vegan. We've been living as vegans and we support the vegan lifestyle. And we had these restaurants and they're successful and they serve, ve but we never said, you know, we're, we're out here in the country. We're not going to slaughter our cow. We thought we'd try. And rather than just let it die and not being used, you know, we're not starting a meat company here. And so it was a very interesting, you know, case of what you're talking about. Like what, what is even hypocrisy now? Um, there are deeper layers to this because, like I said, if somebody is kind of a relationship guru, for example, right? And if someone was talking about, you know, ways to be accountable and have integrity in relationships and always to be transparent and to make sure that you have healthy agreements with anyone you're involved with and you honor those agreements, and then you're, it's revealed by five or 10 or what, you know, a group of women come forward and they say, Hey, this guy's not living by his principles that he's offering people. Well, it doesn't, it's not good for his brand. Let's put it that way. Does it mean that the wisdom that he shared is useless? No, probably not. But it does point to one thing that I think is uh, interesting about this sort of world of, um, podcast in personalities and philosophers and self-help gurus, et cetera. And that is very often it's easy uh, or certainly easier to develop and to embrace and to understand a spiritual thought or a healthy thought or a healthy process and then kind of speak that to somebody. And some people are very good at speaking things. And you'll encounter, particularly in places like LA or, you know, you know Sedona, where there's communities that are people that want to be spiritual and want to be self-evolving. Um, anyone with a certain degree of charisma can pick up a few ideas from wherever, from reading Rumi or whatnot, or from listening to like, you know, uh, some other, you know, Eckhart Tolle wrote and they sort of put it in their own words. It's a lot easier to 
collect wisdom and information, at least, well, maybe not even wisdom, to collect information and knowledge about something and to speak it and to even teach it than it is to really live it, to, to have it in your heart and have it in your bones. And so uh, to me, I, I, I always uh, you know, recommend to people who are interested in um, their own uh, spiritual striving and striving, I don't mean religious, you know, when I say spiritual, I mean like inner work, developing yourself. So when someone's interested in developing themselves um, and their capacities and their um, ability to live according to their own ideals, and they're looking for people to follow or teachers, you know, pick people, um, not just who are speaking words that are wise, um, but living them because they're both out there. And I'm not saying, you know, if it's true that this Andrew guy's cheats on his girlfriends or whatever that you shouldn't listen to him. But, you know, I, with enough people to shop around out there, I, I have found that the people that I've chosen as my spiritual teachers, uh, no, none of them are absolutely perfect human beings, but the ones that I've stuck with really do walk their talk, you know? And so, um, yeah, I think it's, it, it, this, this kind of thing happens in the yoga community a lot. How many times have we heard about these star yoga teachers, particularly male ones, who end up as controversial figures because they've impregnated like several of their students or several of the students said, oh, he sexually harassed me or, you know. So I think there's, um, there's a lot of layers to it. And I think um, what it boils down to me more than anything is uh, my favorite spiritual teacher who's a uh, not among the living, but Rudolf Steiner, who created the Waldorf schools and anthroposophy. He once wrote that for every single step that you take in spiritual self-development, you need to take three steps in moral self-development, right? Because self-development on its own without an ethical moral basis can endow you with kind of powers, powers of insight of how things work and how relationships work and how you know, um, things can be done more efficiently. But if you're not, if you're not um, surrounding the, your newfound capacities with a moral impulse to do good, then you risk um, abusing your, your power. And that's what happens in so many of these people. And so I'm, I'm never surprised to hear about these things. I just wish more of the people out there who are teaching were developing that moral capacity. Um, I guess that's it. Um, how does any of that strike you? Yeah, I well, you kind of said a lot. Morals and then is I, a little well, bit. Yeah, morals is a little bit of a, you know, a um, a subjective term. Yeah, and we all, you know, to some extent, are living in our own world, and then we share our own world. Mm -hmm with others, uh, somebody like Andrew Huberman has been put on a pedestal. And so he appears to then have, he does, he has a lot of power. There's a lot of power in that. And when you put out a takedown piece like that, the power begins to diminish. I do think though, it's interesting though, if you, if you look at, I, I have, I don't, I'm not one, I don't really see any regrets. I'm not like a, a regretful human. Mm -hmm. um, I think that everything that's laid out is in support of, like the chaos is in support of our, our growth, our collective growth, our individual growth. And I imagine in that takedown piece that Andrew Huberman will never be the same in the sense that he'll view his relationships much more differently, um, that it'll open up new portals of conversations when he's dating out in the world. I imagine that other couples who read that article, that there is more information that was shared through that. I do uh, believe that there's a yearning for greater transparency and authenticity uh, and that is, um, and while these pieces can seem unfair, there's a way that it gets us to be more of ourselves and to speak more of ourselves. 
um, you know, to hit, to go back to your article, mm-hmm. this, this line of don't confuse sex and love, love without sex can be shared with anyone and everyone all of the time. Sex with love will leave you with an afterglow. Sex without love will leave you with an aftertaste. You know, do you, can you have casual sex with love? Like if I have an open heart out in the world, man or woman, if a man or woman has an open heart out in the world, can't they say, they, they can say that each of their interactions, that their presence and their loving experiences. I think you're asking, I think the first way you phrased it is, is, is what you're asking. I think you're saying, is it possible to have a casual sexual encounter that's still imbued with love, right? Love of some kind, right? Um, yeah, you know, that's one of those things. The challenge of, of, of presenting an idea in little tidbits is, you, you know, the, the temptation to make it zingy. Um, can you do that, uh, you know, without like adding all kinds of asterisks and stuff? But the, the idea of this idea that you can, that love without sex will leave you with an aftertaste, love, sex with love will leave you with an afterglow. I think the, if I can call it the the pearl of wisdom in that is meant to be that the act of having sex is such an intimate human thing to do that it's worth doing it selectively and consciously. I don't think that I'm, because of what you said, you know, morals, um, again, it, it speaks to balance, right? Because there's an aspect of morality that one can say is m- relative, right? Individual, as you said, it's an individual thing. That's sort of the basis of the idea of moral relativism. But then somebody else might say, well, there's also something such as a universal morality. Like most people agree that like killing a person is not a good thing or that honesty is a good thing, right? So there's aspects that you could say, there's a there's somewhere a balance between individual morality and um, universal morality. So I'm not trying to dictate anybody's definition of what with love means here, but I know that's, you know, from my own experience over whatever at this point, 40 years of being sexually active. Oh my God. I can't believe I'm quantifying that way. Uh, you know, I've had enough encounters to realize, and you know, that, um, when there really is a connection that's beyond just the primal connection, there's something, there is something special. And that that's what I'm describing as the afterglow. You feel like you've really connected with a person. If you're, and it doesn't mean like, oh, you have to be married to them or you have to be in a committed relationship. Maybe that's the ideal because I think there are certain levels of intimacy um, that you can only get to through really becoming involved with someone. That doesn't mean that you can't have you know, um, a sexual encounter that's not in the context of a long-term committed monogamous relationship that isn't really meaningful and special. I think it's more challenging. Like if you just, like on a scale of whatever, like if you just met somebody, you know, on a beach and then you have sex with them and I'm not denying that I've done that at some point in my life. Um, versus you're you've been involved with someone for a long time and you're really getting to know them and you've had conflict and you've had resolution and you've had deep communication um the chances are that you're going to have a, a a more uh, fulfilling meaningful loving sexual encounter um in the context of, of relationship but I, i'm just sort of like what i'm trying to say in that point is um be aware of of the difference of what sex is because of course you can have sex um, without love and it doesn't, act, it's not going to kill you. Right. It doesn't, I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. Aftertaste isn't necessarily even a bad thing, but it's, a, it's a particular thing, right? You might have a good aftertaste, but aftertaste is kind of like, you know, it's more of a, the indication is that it's something that your senses lingers with your senses, right? And after glow is like a spiritual lingering and aftertaste 
it's like, you know, you ate something and then you're, it's like, hmm, often it's not a good aftertaste, but sometimes it is a good aftertaste, but it's still a taste because um, when it's more casual, a sexual encounter really has more to do with the senses than, you know, you can have an open heart, but how, how much real deep connection is really happening when you don't know the person that well? Does that explain it a little bit better? Th that does. I'm going to switch gears because I, I, I know something, you know, you've been in the Los Angeles area for quite some time, surrounded around conscious community, uh, dabbled in the world of psychedelics. And we've seen the rise of, you know, more people doing ceremonies to um, maybe with a goal of reaching enlightenment in some way or healing trauma. And you, what I do know about you is that you have opinions. <laughs> That's true. No shortage of those. So you want uh, to talk about that? Yeah, because I think this intertwines. I, I want to, I more want to see the world through your lens in, in how you're viewing morals and evolution, love and relationships. Uh, but you want to tie that into the sort of sacrament psychedelic world? Yes, this, this because that's going to keep that there's more and more people getting right. enrolled into that yeah. world as it becomes more legalized as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And here's one of those things where you'll probably tell in my um, answer, which is, I don't really have a rote answer. It's, you know, I'm going to go off the cuff, but there'll be some level of of balance in it. Okay, so here's my attempt at, um, um, and it's not artificial. It's it. Uh, I think it's organic to where I'm at. I personally have, um, over time, I was uh, always intrigued with um, mind expansion. Let's call it that, right? Expanding your consciousness, consciousness expansion. But I was also always wary of drugs. You know, I grew up um, with parents that weren't very informative they just basically just said don't do drugs drugs are bad don't do drugs you know and that kind of stuck with me through most of high school i smoked a little pot in high school once or twice and then when i got to college it kind of all bets were off because i was around a bunch of really smart exploratory people who increasingly exposed me to different drugs and i just started um trying different things um and i had a rather thorough exploration of that and pretty early on also not just you know i mean I, i'm a musician uh by trade have been uh, primarily for much of my life. And, you know, that's a, such a part of music culture and rock and roll was always people like, though the Beatles, like you see the Beatles behind me and these psychedelic portraits, right? And um, so I kind of, you almost couldn't be participate in that culture and that sense of what it meant to be an artist without um, having a bit of an exploratory bent to you. Probably didn't, uh, didn't hurt that I'm also a double Aquarius. You know, we like to try, you know, we're not tend to be, we don't tend to be limited easily by social constructs and, and rules. And so, um, and I would read also about um, the spiritual approaches to drugs. I read a book, um, a famous book. I can't remember the author uh, about ayahuasca early on before anyone was doing it. Or it was available to anybody. I read about this in, I think in the 1990 or so. And, um, and I'd read about peyote. And so, you know, over a couple of decades, I, I smoked a lot of pot. I did LSD a few times. I did, you know, mushrooms, uh, pretty heavy doses a few times. I, I, I tried, uh, I did a peyote, uh, ceremony once. Um, and, uh, did some other, you know, non drug oriented things that were connected to sacrament consuming uh, communities, particularly Native American sort of uh, sweat lodge and vision quest things. So I so I really um, was intrigued by that and, and actively explored those things um, up until about, I guess, 17 years ago. Uh, and the end of the road was ayahuasca for me. And I had a very uh, intense experience. It was transformative in many ways, but um, it was really a turning point for me because I, I had what you would call parallel paths. I was also very uh, rigorously involved in, in 
meditation and self-development work and trying to like relational work and trying to become healthy and nonviolent communication. And so for a while, I was able to kind of hold these parallel paths of meditating daily and doing yoga and all that stuff and trying to be conscious. And then, you know, occasionally smoking pot and then occasionally doing what was intended to be a spiritual self-awakening. I never thought like enlightenment, as you mentioned, it was at the end of that road. But I thought maybe there was, you know, sparks of that. It would help me in my spiritual growth. Um, and what I found uh, over time was, and this is not this is not a, a popular opinion nowadays. As you said, people are getting so into psychedelics and plant medicine, as it's called. Um, and I, I I do think that there are are likely some really good uses uh, for various plant medicines. And I know that um, a lot of people have been helped with uh, their sobriety. For example, people who have addiction problems or alcoholism have been helped through, you know, ayahuasca experiences or some people are, um, that I know do microdosing and it helps them with anxiety issues and stuff like that. So I know that there are people who feel they've been healed or bettered by psychedelic experiences, whether big epiphany style experiences or by microdosing, which is kind of the opposite. But, um, I, for me, I, it, 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 uh, I, I began to recognize it for me as a hindrance. It felt like uh, I started wondering what was the price I was paying for these epiphany moments and these expansions and these moments of like, oh my God, I'm seeing into the universe or I see these different beings. I've, I've certainly had some pretty incredible experiences, but I have to tell you that the most mind-blowing experiences I've ever had in terms of uh, expanded consciousness happened in meditation and not with drugs. I mean, I mean, I'm not exaggerating to say that, you know, two hits of acid or, you know, a big dose of ayahuasca or peyote have never paralleled or even approached the, uh, the handful of experiences that I would call real grace or real expansions of consciousness. And I, and I, and I think I'd, I suspect that I might be having more of those or be further along in my self-development journey had there not been some kind of corollary price, it gets very esoteric, frankly. And I don't know how many people are going to lose with this, but um, if I were to kind of summarize my doubts about those things, it's it's as follows: I believe that we that our kind of energy organs or, or you know chakras people talk about um, that those are kind of the the carriers of our of our spiritual capacities, and that you can take certain substances that will kind of turn on and enliven different chakras. If you take ecstasy, it'll kind of open up your heart chakra. If you take acid, it'll open up your third eye and you see things, you know, and maybe ayahuasca does this one or there's, you know, mushrooms are kind of, and so we have these artificial stimulations of these organs of spiritual perception and expansion. These organs, which can normally be developed and stimulated and fortified through healthy non-drug practices. Um, and so the difference between these two things is, as I, as I understand it, and, um, is that the drug induced or the sacrament induced experience, while it will open something up in you, it kind of then, once the substance is out of your body, your chakra then go reverts and it may not be left in the best state. You know, I think it sort of can scramble your chakras. And so people have these like, Oh my God, I had this amazing insight, but because we're not like all clairvoyant spiritual healers, we don't really know what we've done to ourselves in the, in the bigger picture. And so I, you know, I don't regret the experiences I've had, but I chose to discontinue them. And when I talk to people about things, uh, these things, I just, uh, I recommend kind of awareness around them. And uh, my one of my spiritual teachers uh, who is, is living, Lisa Romero, wrote a great book called A Bridge to Spirit, which I recommend to anybody who's uh, considering or has, um, you know, followed those pathways. Um, it's a very esoteric, uh, I think very wise take on some of the dangers of seeking spiritual enlightenment or exp- expansion through taking drugs or sacraments. Is that does that sort of, uh, I know I said a mouthful there. Yeah, yeah. And I heard you say is like that it can scramble your awareness. Was that? I think, I mean, it's a, it's a loosely chosen word, but I think it can sort of scramble your chakras a little bit. In other words, 
I see the chakras in terms of the things I've studied as as these organs that are kind of uh, um, semi-asleep in most people. In other words, we don't go around having third eye experiences all the time and or being connected to the cosmos or having our heart completely open. But that we can, you can work on them just like you go to the gym and you work on your muscles. You can work on your heart chakra by practicing transparency, by practicing compassion, by practicing kindness. Things happen just the way things happen to your muscles. When you work out like this, things happen to your your organs, uh, your energetic organs. And so, and those can be developed in a really healthy way. And so there's nothing bad is going to happen to them through a practice of kindness for 10 years, you know, or your consciousness and how you use your words, um, how you speak, how your you know, conscious uh, honesty and speaking with integrity might build this chakra that has is associated with communication in a very healthy way. Now, you might take a substance that does like act through your body somehow like creates a, re a reaction in your one of your chakras that leads you to like a mind blowing experience. But I think that's a very different process from the healthy kind of slog of developing your chakras over time through meditation and all of those things. And so I guess what I'm suggesting is um, the bit like the equivalent of like taking a bunch of steroids one day and like suddenly like, oh my God, I took all these steroids and I was able to, you know, bench press 260 pounds and, you know, but there's always something that happens to your muscles after you do that. You know, it's like, if we, it's like looking at the enlightened, the epiphany experience from ayahuasca or something like that, but not understanding the esoteric implications of what happened to your chakras um, is kind of like doing steroids and getting these big muscles and having the strength, man, I did that, but not, not knowing that you might be having tumors in your muscles or something in your system might have gone wrong or your liver might be toxic from it. And I don't, I don't pretend to be an expert on what exactly happens to your chakras, but my own um, intuitive work and meditating around that for years was started feeling validated when I was reading what other people who I consider more evolved than me were writing about it. And that's why I mentioned that book, Bridge to Spirit, because I think it's much more uh, wisely can um, expand upon the kind of things I'm saying. But that's sort of what I meant by scramble. Like, what are we doing to those organs of perception that open up when we have psychedelic experiences in the aftermath? Yeah, that's an, that's definitely an, an interesting question to ponder. Now you say that, I heard you say, yeah, that there's people that you view as more evolved than you. Mm -hmm. how, how does someone even come to, like, wh why do you see, how do, how do you see somebody as being quote unquote more evolved? Well, I don't, you know, I don't, there's not a lot of emotion attached to a statement like that, but, um, well, it's just like, it's no different from saying, it's just shorthand. It's like no different from saying, you know, that musician is just, you know, they're just a way better improviser than I am. Like I can look at a musician, I play the guitar, right? I play a lot of instruments and I play the guitar and I'm really good at certain things on the guitar. I'm a really good rhythm player. I come up with great parts. I can sit there and, you know, but I've never been one of those people that's like, can, you know, play a, a wicked ripping guitar solo. And so I don't have much emotion attached to looking at somebody who can do that. And boy, anyone who's on Instagram knows anything you can be good at, right? There's like somebody on Instagram that's like mind-blowingly good at something. It's humbling, but it's really instructive just to be like, wow, people are amazing at things. And so... When I say more evolved, evolved is yeah, such a broad, you know, what does that even mean? But when I say, um, you know, there's a handful of people I've met, you know, where I feel like this person is living more in alignment with their ideals than I am at this point. Mm -hmm. This person has been able to integrate um certain things that I even know spiritually, but has been able, has been able, is more able to live them. And so I want to learn from this person, right? I mean, that's how we recognize mentors. I mean, what kind of mentor would it be if I didn't have some uh, veneration for a person's capacity to be a little bit, for me to perceive them a little bit further along that path? So that's what I mean. When I say more evolved, it's sort of like 
you know, new millennium shorthand for um, further along a path that I'm, I myself am endeavoring to follow, you know? Yeah, yeah, that makes I guess. Ooh, sneezing. <laughs> uh, uh, so we, we talked a little bit about love and and wanting to feel more like humans wanting to feel the sense of belonging and wanting to feel unconditional love. I have a strong opinion on what that process is. And I'm curious of where you would align or not align with it. So to me, love, and and it goes hand in hand with self-love and love for others. Love is a process of removing layers of the ego. Things that are holding you back from being the highest version of yourself. That could be pride, um, fear. Uh, for for example, I used to have a huge fear of public speaking. Years ago, the idea of having a podcast was like, what? No way. Um, so I held on to this like I wasn't speaking because there was this fear of speaking. So my journey towards greater love, it, that self-love was uh, owning my voice and not hoarding because it, the, the, it's, it's the removing layers of the ego coupled with ever-increasing acts of sharing. We give to who we love. And there's, you know, there, again, there's pride, there's the fear. Um, and then there's also the things that create more deeper connection. So I, this morning, I did my first session with a new therapist. Um, I am curious to experience EMDR. It's kind of the, the therapy that's the rapid eye movement therapy to kind of went into it with how can I even more go deeper within myself so I can more like understand myself so I can more um, deeply connect with those around me. Uh, I'll notice at times I um, will feel that I've left the present moment and I'm in my head trying to gnaw on something and I'm not necessarily being fully there with other people in some specific social situation. So it was what my, my therapist is calling performance-based is that we're starting with the present moment and we're moving forward in the future. And so in the love, it's like this self-understanding because after having today's session, I can see some of the edges the areas in my life where I might be holding back. And because there's a way like in love requires courage and the ability to be bold. And that's also creates advancement. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you also have to be willing to lose something like almost like because as you're as you continue to become more of who you're intended to be you might shift social circles um you might realize that you've outgrown a particular relationship and then this idea of coupling the you know removing layers of the ego coupled with ever increasing acts of sharing uh it's not only that process of being like, okay, I'm going to quote unquote get naked because I'm ripping, I'm saying the vulnerable things, I'm being the, you know, the highest version of myself. And that um, can be 
fearful because you might think differently about me and you might leave me and I might say something that creates disalignment and now we're no longer alive. But in that process of me doing that, I'm sharing with you. Yes, I'm sharing myself. And also I think why I say it's coupled with ever increasing acts of sharing because we give to who we love. That's resources, that's connections, that's, you know, there's a lot out there of hoarding of ideas, you know, so many times, you know, we've been, and I, and I think too, it's it's interesting that you could go into that topic too, because what are they, the, the line, um, prosper in silence. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, which is a, another interesting theory to unpack prosper in silence. It's like, okay, I can, I can be taking in so much information that I'm now rapidly evolving and I might not want to tell the world because that could feel that could appear as prideful. But then, you know, I watched this video when my Kabbalah teachers actually, he was saying, he was putting out this there prosper in silence uh, and saying like, if you're falling in love, keep that to yourself. If you're, generating more income, keep that to yourself. If you're growing exponentially, keep that to yourself because it can bring in the evil eye towards you. It can invite envy towards you. However, it's interesting because then there's the other side of it that, well, where do we see love lived? Because in that experience of all of those experiences of of prospering, nobody just prospers with a skip and a step. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm going to go prosper right now. And I'm just going to float up there. And let me hide that so you don't see, so you don't get jealous of my beautiful butterfly prospering. Uh, And so that's even, you know, of, because now it's like, I get, I get the concept of um, why you would want to do, because not to invite the evil eye, not to invite the envy, not to, um, you know, throw the, it could even say you could throw balance off inside of that. Um, and so, I, so you, yeah. you've, you've, we've gone to a couple of different territories here. So I want to make sure that I address, because um, it began with, you have very particular, strong ideas about love, right? Yes. And about the ego and vulnerability and and all that stuff. So I just want to make sure that I, before we go too far afield from that, that I can um, address what you're saying. Um, Do you feel like you you got to a point where you want me to to start responding? Go go hit it. Go hit it. (laughs) Um, So working backwards, maybe. in terms of this sh- sh- prosper and silence thing. I think it's, again, that's sort of one of these pithy, pithy things that has truth contextually. Does it mean it's always right to not speak? Because um, you're saying, yeah, well, what, what does that even mean? Or was that always, you know? To my take on that is, it's more about being conscious about when you speak, like when you said, Oh, I've acquired all this new knowledge and like, but shouldn't I share it? You know? Um, I think there's a temptation when, when especially people who are trying to expand and learn, get a new idea or a new concept, but like, and it could literally be like a roomy quote. It's like, Oh my God, that's so right. You know, I have to now spread this out there. You know? Um, I think that the process, uh, that should come before speaking it is the process of integration. You know, we get, we think often that we have a new insight or that we've retained a new level of development when we get this in, when we, when we have the insight, but the insight has to move from, Oh, this totally makes sense. I'm going to do this now into your lived experience. And when it's in your lived experience, then you're better equipped to teach it because then you're not regurgitating the thing that you learned you're speaking from your your real um, from your spirit more than from your mind, and I, I've had to. I'm, I'm I'm constantly learning this myself and trying to reassess. Like, am I speaking from a place where I'm just, you know, re uh, retweeting somebody's idea spiritually, or 
I'm speaking out of something that I've really lived and learned the hard way and in- integrated. Um, I think you, you venture into superstition when it's about like, um, what do I, should I be quiet that I'm in love or not? Sh- you know, I, I, I don't any, and superstition is fear-based and I think um, kind of um, a trap in terms of misinterpreting how the sort of magical dance of the cosmos works you know like uh, some people act sometimes like god just has a really sick sense of humor that's even in the depeche mode song right like like if i say this too loud then god's gonna punish me or like if i you know um if i'm too brazen about this or that no i don't i don't think that that's how it works i don't think god is this obnoxious uh, character male or female or both or whatever like the entity that's like monitoring what you're saying it's like oh i'll show you you know um and I do think that there are good and bad forces in the world. So I'm not completely dismissing this idea of, of the of the evil eye. But I think, you know, it's one thing to like, you got a new gig or something, you know, that's really great. Oh, I finally got this, you know. And of, of course, what could be wrong about sharing that joy and sense of achievement, like with people you care about, like, oh, my God, can I tell you, I just, you know, I got to work with this amazing musician or like for you, like, oh, they're going to take my podcast and put it on this big platform you know like what could be wrong with that if the energy of your feeling is this feels like a validation of my work and like an an affirmation that i'm doing something good in the world you know versus if you're bragging to everybody you know you've seen everyone's seen someone at a cocktail party saying like well you know i just did this you know there's a different energy where it's trying to you know attract admiration by by bragging about something versus telling someone you know like of course, if you're among your single friends that have, and you've all been yearning for love for years and years and years, and suddenly you fall in love, right? And you've got this relationship, like it would seem totally inorganic and weird for you to hide that or not tell people about it or like, oh, I don't want to tell her. You know, I remember when people, when Renee and I were trying to conceive our child, you know, people would, you know, be cautious about telling us that they were, they'd gotten pregnant, you know, because they knew we were trying for a few years. And it was like, I'm not going to feel bad about you getting pregnant just because I'm trying, you know, because I was in a healthy state about it. You know, if I'd been in an unhealthy state about it and be like, screw them, you know, we've been trying for three years and they just tried for two, you know, like those are all like fear based and limitation based mindset. So I feel like it's more important to attend to like, where, where am I at in terms of living in, in alignment with my ideals? Because if I'm really just trying to do good in the world and trying to be of use and trying to make my work do do some good for people and like then you're going to be coming from a place of like um where the sharing is uh sp- spreads joy and if somebody doesn't respond in that way then they're probably not in a really healthy state you know but there is this difference between bragging and sharing something uh in terms of the silence and then and so again as it applies to uh wisdom and insights itself but earlier on you were saying some other things about vulnerability and how love can change uh the way you live i had two thoughts along the way one was um as a kind of blanket statement i think there's a lot of things in the world that we think is love that that's that's not really love and one good uh gauge of that is if you're doing something out of self-interest it's probably not really love if you're doing, if you're with someone and it's, people don't want to hear this because it's not like it, re- it wrecks a lot of romantic notions. It's nice when, when somebody makes you feel good about yourself, but if you're with them because they make you feel good about yourself, then you're just stoking your feeling. You're, you're, you know, it's kind of, it's still ego based in a way. Um, there's a difference between, you know, dating someone who's like really attractive. And like, when I walk in the room with this partner and everyone's like, Oh man, look at that. Look at why they they really got a hot partner. You know, there's unconscious ways, um, or look, they have a partner that must, they must really have their act together. You know, they're in love. You know, there's so many little ways that the ego tricks you into thinking that like all of this stuff that make, that feels good about infatuation and being in love is really is love, but there's so much of it's not love and it's not bad. I love infatuation, you know, and I love feeling good about myself and all those little things, but I'm trying to be increasingly clear about what's really love. Um, I think love is a little bit more in the direction of like, you really 
are taking in the being of someone and you have admiration and you, you recognize the beauty in, in who they are and you enjoy being in communion with them and you feel like that your time together is mutually enriching in a way and helps you both grow and expand. You know, I think those things are closer to love than I feel good about myself, you know, and all, yeah. and all that stuff. And, and consequently, like, I think the, the healthier a mindset that you can, not just mindset, the healthier way of being that you can cultivate, the healthier you're going to be in relationship. And, and then, and the less courage in a way it takes, vulnerability is, as you said, it's kind of a laying bare of yourself uh, and a willingness to look at parts of yourself that might not be that easy to look at, you know, that, that come up in the context of a relationship. And I think relationships can be very beneficial in that way. In the most uncomfortable moments, they're the most beneficial. They're the most fun when you're having great sex or having a romantic moment and you're just doing some great vacation together. That's not really the reality of, of relationships for the most part. You know, the growth happens when you rub up, when you bump up against someone or there's something that's challenging. And, um, and so I, I, you know, I, I've in, in my own dating experiences, I've, I've, I've encountered so much fear. Um, even the, even the fear itself of like this ending, you know, like this, this is, I think more prevalent in American women in a way, but like, there's this sense of like, I want to know where this relationship's going to go before I even start walking down the path of it. You know, I want to know, it's like, you want to have some guarantee that this is going to be a long-term thing, or this is the one, you're the one, I want to got to figure out if you're the one or not, all the stuff about the one. When I think people are really in a healthy state of mind, if they meet somebody who's intriguing enough and, you know, attractive, not just physically, but like there's a, there's a real connection worth exploring, then the vulnerability of like, this might not last forever, or this might hurt me at some point isn't that, isn't that big a deal? You know, if you know, I'm okay on, on my own, I'm okay with myself. I'm okay in the world. I, I know that growth comes from challenge. Then you're not going to be so afraid of like, you know, being hurt or being left or ending up alone, or it didn't work out. Or, you know, this brought out something in me or in the other person I didn't want to see. I don't know. I think, I just think, I guess what I'm saying is if people are really aware of what love is, you know, beyond the ego stuff and the infatuation and the chemistry and stuff, then they wouldn't be on the one hand as eager to jump into it. And also, so also on the other hand, not so afraid of getting out of it because if it's all happening and, and it's all in the name of helping each other grow and connect and experience it, experiencing the world and life in richer ways, then it's worth whatever those little risks are of being hurt or being vulnerable. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. How's your love life right now? Mm. My life is full of love. I mean, the greatest love I have is um, as a father for my five-year-old, you know, that's a kind of love that's, um, indescribable. Um, that's about as close to unconditional love, I think, as I've experienced with a person. I think it's easy in a way or easier to love your child unconditionally than it is to love a partner unconditionally or a family member unconditionally. Um, and I have a great love that I share with my partner who, uh, brought this child into the world with me and we you know we share a home together and it's very loving um and uh i share so much love with friends you know male and female friends and people i'm working with in terms of uh you know like uh hot romantic uh passionate love it's you know there's been a you know a little bit of a it go. It comes. It, it ebbs and flows, you know. And uh, there's been a little bit of an ebb, but uh, but I, you know, love. As I said, if you're separating out the romantic, passionate, physical love, uh, love itself is available in so many beautiful forms. 
it's it's a, in a way kind of I think a cultural flaw in our system that we only think of love as that like sex partner romantic love because that's a great thing and I love that and I've had that at different times in my life and um and uh and then at times not and it's not the be all end all it's just a like one great thing you know it's like ice cream is a great food but like it's not the total the totality of food it isn't pizza and ice cream you know and uh so i kind of look at it at that um so yeah i love pizza and ice cream and i love romantic love and sex and all that and that fun stuff and you know and i think that comes and goes in in people's familial relationships and partnerships you know um even in committed sort of monogamous relationships or uh yeah so i can't say that there's been a lack of love in my life but it depends on the exact nature of your question. I do know uh, you went to a dating salon, a love club dating salon there in Los mm-hmm. Angeles recently. And those dating salons, members of the love club are hosting them. And it's a small group, half men, half women. It's generally heterosexuals. Uh currently inside of the love club and they're coming together to not for matchmaking purposes, although, Hey, that's possible, but rather to have a philosophical discussion on love and dating. And sometimes in those spaces, uh, you know, people have a lot of, uh, things to complain about let's say complain about in love and relationships and they can feel exhausted by them one of the things that we like to invite into the dating salons is curiosity and hope and um, the sharing the, the positive aspects being shared of how people are navigating their love life I'm curious what your experience was like at the dating salon. Well, that's a good, that's a good uh, question to kind of uh, maybe tie a lot of our stuff together. Um, I'm just looking at the clock and realizing, wow, we're really, we're, uh, we're, we're good at uh, just floating off into conversation. The two of I know us. I always um, can, my, my conversations can run. That's why I figured I was like, I'm going to ask him about the dating salon and then we'll wrap it. Yeah. 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 So that's a good, maybe that's a good, uh, a good sort of like wrap up topic. Um, I, I thought it was great. First of all, I think it's a wonderful thing for people to come together and, and, you know, in a sort of environment of meeting new people and sharing thoughts about dating to kind of, have the stuff of the meeting be talking about it, you know, and then just interacting and sharing things. And, and, um, there were so many different interesting things I found. Um, for one thing, uh, all of the men in the group that I was in had interesting, unconventional life situations with regard to their, you know, like one guy was married, but his wife was halfway around the globe in another country and they didn't really necessarily have a seemingly seemed a committed marriage, you know, but they were married. And there was another guy that was in kind of a post, you know, with marriage co-parenting situation with like sort of half maybe living together. I don't know. Everyone, everyone it was kind of a, a good cross section of like the dating world is a particularly among people of a particular age who are at least old enough who might have already had a primary relationship or been married and, you know, um, that there are, uh, a, as many unique manifestations of life situation and relationship as there are people. And that makes dating in the modern world interesting, but it also makes it challenging for people because I think people have people, a lot of people go into dating with like, this is who I am and this is what I want, you know? And the older you get, the more complicated people become, you know, because they have or haven't been, married they may or may not want marriage they may or may not want kids they may or may not want to live in the same place they may or may not want to travel a lot you know there's so many different like we were saying earlier there's so many different um options and opportunities and so many different challenges too right 
someone has a kid, they might be totally available for a relationship, but not available to travel. Um, you know, so, um, so it's interesting to see those things. And I think, um, that what makes that process easier and I almost wish there were just classes or workshops. And I, at some point, I, I thought about hosting a, a workshop in this in terms of just dating etiquette, right? Because I think etiquette, again, it sounds like one of these sort of old world restrictive, like judgmental words, like etiquette, oh, there's rules, you know? But, I, but I, what I mean by that is um, there are conscious ways to navigate through dating life meaning particularly how you treat other people and how you commun communicate with them that I think would make things easier for everybody. And I think when people were talking about positive and negative experiences in that salon, um, this came up a lot, right? Like how people treat each other on dating apps, for one thing, right? You said the dating app world, world is crumbling. That would be, I mean, I hope you're right in a way because I, I'm a, a real believer in meeting people in real life and, and literally everyone, but one person that I've ever been involved with, I've met in real life. There's one woman I met in New York years ago on an app and we dated for a few months, but like, and I've gone on a lot of dates, you know, I've been on and off internet dating at different times in my life. Um, and, but it's fascinating to me, the culture of communication on there. Um, I type, I try, I've, at the times when I've been on apps or whatever, I really tried to uh, be uh, what I would call a gentleman, you know, in other words, but that applies to men or being, a, I, I think, you know, just being a kind person, meaning if I've had an interaction with somebody, even like a couple of messages, and it doesn't seem like I'm interested anymore, I will say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think that uh, I'd, I'd like to get together, but it was really nice chatting with you. And I hope you find some, you know, like, it's like you you wouldn't talk to somebody at a party and then just turn around and walk away. You'd say like a polite person will say like, hey, you know, I'm gonna, I saw a friend of mine over there. I'm going to go chat, but nice talking to you. You know, little courtesies like that. Um, I've seen people just like they just ghost, you know, like they decide they don't they're not interested or whatever, just ghost or they'll be judgmental. You know, uh, you know, when I was dating uh, before having this child and like starting this very unconventional partnering relationship with like some women would be really positive and say like, oh, what a beautiful thing you're doing. You're having a child with your best friend. And then other people just be judgmental and you can't do this. And like, so it's almost like there's a space in on the online dating world, which really dominates most of dating now, um, where people treat each other almost like they're in their cars. And, you know, like when someone cuts you off, like it's just a stranger in a video game versus another human being, you know, and I love so much of the work that you're doing because your work is so focused on bringing people together in real life and real life situations and connecting as human beings versus having this weird technology that somehow for people who are not really conscious about it creates a veil of, of impersonality that leads them to be rude or inconsiderate or nasty even, you know, or just plain careless. And so I think that's what it, what I'm encountering with people is in the in the as the biggest problem is just people not being kind and mm -hmm. respectful when they're communicating. And I wish somebody could educate. Uh, I know, and but you know, men and women do it. Men do weird things that most women don't do, like they're sending you know, dick pics or whatever, and 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 saying things way too early, you know, that are suggestive or whatever that nobody's invited. But but both men and women, I think, you know, misbehave in this context. And so, you know, the solutions are a, someone needs to educate people on how to, you know, uh, you know, live along, uh, like I said earlier, in, in accordance with their personal ideals and not have some fake set of rules where, oh, but it's just online dating. So I can just like treat them like shit or just toss them around. Um, or uh, on the other hand, do what you're doing, which is like bypass that system and the the toxicity that seems inherent to it and create situations where people can meet in real life and cultivate the old world, right? This is where conservatism comes in, right? Like there's something kind of conservative about what you're doing, but I love it because you're finding new progressive ways to do something that you value from the past, which is like good old fashioned people meeting in person and flirting, right? 
flirting and getting to know each other and feeling a vibration and seeing if there's chemistry, all of those things, right, that I, you've always been really good at promoting, I think that's a great way to kind of offset the toxicity of the culture that the impersonal nature of dating apps is, is doing to people. So I think people who are single uh, are very well served by things like the Love Club and some of your other events because, you know, A, like it educates them, like we were talking about this stuff in Love Club. So it educates them on like how to be and how to like, you know, maybe weed out people that aren't being respectful and kind, but also giving them opportunities to like meet in real life, talk, connect, and, you know, maybe something happens organically. So power to you for doing that. Thank you. Yeah, it is beautiful to witness the healing that is happening because inside the club, it's half men, half women. Mm-hmm. And they're getting to, I'm watching them fall in love with each other, not necessarily for, you know, that's my one or for the romantic purposes, but that they, even like the woman to woman, uh, one of, one of, one of our members yesterday, I was on the phone with for a couple hours, um, during a, a, a coaching session with her and she was sharing how even inside of the love club, as she's getting closer to some of the women and some of the men that like, wow, this is dating because her belief was that you meet someone, you go on a date, you go on another date after like three dates, you decide to be exclusive and then you're in a relationship. And instead they're building these bonds over time and also be, you know, and, and, and taking the spaciousness to, create the connection and not force the connection, not determine what the connection should be, not go into it. Like, is this yes or no? And, and to something that you said a little bit earlier, I remember when, um, you know, the relationship I'm in now, we, uh, we, we dated for quite some time for like nine to 11 months or so before we entered like, Hey, let's, let's, let's do relationship together. Um, and not, date a bunch of other people. And when I had went to a couple of, I remember two girlfriends had said to me around this time, again, we're newly like, okay, we're, we're, we're in relationship now. And they're like, is it for forever? Right. Such a crazy I was like what? And these were two of my close friends who are really conscious women. And to hear them and say, and, and have to, to, to respond for that. I remember one of them, the guy was actually beside me in the moment and he was in another conversation and she whispered it to me like is it for forever and i'm like what well, I, I don't know <laughs> that's this deep that's this really deep cinderella programming you know and men have it too it's every pop song that you've ever heard and every romantic comedy and every disney movie has all these like notions about like forever and the one and yeah. You know what? It's and wonderful. Say, at the same you know? time, like I also, I don't love the idea that we judge the fairy tales either. That we've actually started to be like, this is not a fairy tale. You know, this is real life. Get the Disney story out of your head. I also think that that's not exactly the way to, to crush the fairy tale. I love the idea of romanticism and um, and the uh, like the feeling of aliveness that you can get. Look, from- you're talking to somebody who, for like the first couple of decades of my career, I, I'm a pop musician. I, my, I'm mostly writing love songs. I'm I'm on board with you, but what you're expressing is balance. What I was saying earlier, it's like you know the recognition that there's something of value. There's a reason for all these love songs and all these little movies and the fairy tales. And they stimulate something in us that's real. Um, But at the same time, yeah, there's something about real life relationships and love that far transcends this very simplistic picture of what of romantic love equaling love and of it being a magical journey with this one special person and everybody has one special person. So like, yeah, the balanced approach to this is what's worth keeping about the mythical programming that I've 
been subjected to culturally and what's worth letting go of. Because then you can retain the thing that was of value and you don't have to become cynical, right? People tend to be so polarized. It's like, oh yeah, that's a bullshit myth. And, you know, love doesn't exist or the one doesn't exist. Well, like there are some people that find like this partner and they have a lifelong partnership and it's a beautiful thing. Some people find this one partner and they have a lifelong partner life of conflict and they're stuck with them. Some people never, some people have three amazing partnerships in their lives. You know, my father has had just in the last, since he was in his late fifties, he's had two significant partners. Both of them died, you know, but like a 16 year relationship, a six year relationship. And he was deeply in love with these women. And before that, I mean, early on, he was married to my mother. There were a few other women along the way. So there's some people that experience real love several times there's some people that sadly never are in a long partnership and uh and everything in between you know so the fact that there's this one cultural um image of what that is can be detrimental to people because most people don't have a seamless adventure of like you know just waiting along and then prince charming or the princess appears and then we sail off into the sunset together I don't know anybody. I, I, mean, I know I can I can count like two or three friends that have kind of marriages that are sort of like that, and they're still very difficult marriages. These are people that still, even with their soulmate, they've slogged through some really tough periods, you know. So, I, I guess what I'm saying is, you're right. Like, let's not throw out the idea of romantic love and of finding like having an incredible connection and that feeling of like when you are in love with someone feeling like you really are meant for me and we're we have a unique thing that's unlike anything else you know but also like not like idolize it and and get and so specifically believe it that we fail to learn about and understand all the the other sort of real world aspects of what love and relationships are like you know i sort of think about it like with people like with the bible or something you know it's like some people are like this is either literally true, like every word of it, you know, and other people are like, it's all bullshit, because if you think that's literally true, then you're crazy. And then other people are like, well, maybe some of this is metaphorical. And these are parables. And some stories are literally true. And some part are part literally true. And some are totally like, allegorical lessons, you know what I mean? Like, so let's let's take the same approach to like the romantic prototype, I guess, you know? Yeah. Balance. What a great what a great discussion. Uh you're definitely a philosopher. You know that, right? All right. I'll take that. Yeah, for sure. Uh what do you have? Like what do you what are you working on now? What do you what do you have coming up? I think most importantly, uh for the I'm still um, like I said, I've got the Omega Male uh podcast which you can just find under Omega Mail or just Omega Mail Dan McKenzie, um, which is, as I said, a, a slow burn, but that's going. And I've been, I've been actually uh, writing the book to go with that. And so I'm hoping to kind of get that a little further along so I can start finding a publisher. Um, so in that sort of, in my Dan as philosopher realm, those are the most important uh, things going on. Occasionally I get um, opportunities to present or speak. Um, nothing in, on the immediate docket and I'm um, just working on some music other than that too, producing records for some really talented people. Um, and so that's a kind of a great blessing too. So it's basically the writing and podcasting and, and, uh, and music. Amazing. Well, thank you for this conversation and thank you for uh, sharing yourself inside of the We Deep End ecosystem and showing up and being a part of it and you know your thoughts even to within I remember back in the day I, I think a little bit more that always was interesting to see what you would write in the Esther Perel discussion um, I don't find myself on Facebook as often I'm as I'm trying to spend less time on, on Facebook and therefore on that too but I yeah those are those are interesting I love these forums I should also say yeah, I'm available to if anyone listening to this wants a minute cares to have me invite me to speak anywhere I do I do that occasionally um but I like you know I I just think that the so much of um healthy knowledge and wisdom and growth yes it does get passed to us 
by people who have done a lot of work and they can teach us things and we can learn to integrate it. But so much of it comes out of these kind of interactive conversations where it's like the thing about two people are more gathering consciously. There is something, there's like a divine spark that enters when there's intention. And um, so, yeah, a Facebook forum is not usually uh, always the healthiest thread, you know, uh, the healthiest uh, forum for those things. But even a Facebook conversation can 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 yield something in the ways of new ideas emerging or insights or people, you know, gaining from something. So, yeah, I'm trying to do less uh, time spent on those things and have more real world conversations and interactions and um, conscious meetings. But uh, but I do. I do thrive uh, on that uh, on that kind of creative conversation and the kind that we've just had. So thank you. You're for welcome. Having me thank you. Time. We'll share your your uh, contact information in the description and uh, anywhere that you can be reached in your music and your podcasts. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much, Daniel. Thank you. And thank you all for listening to another episode of Deep End with Christina. Again, if you do enjoy this podcast, please do like, subscribe, rate, give it five stars. It helps more people find it, helps me continue to host it. And definitely go check out what we have going on at wedeepend.com. Fill out the application for the Love Club. Also, if you are in relationship, we I work with... Eden World. Eden World is a community for committed couples. It's run by Sierra Sullivan and Rano Smith. You can see it at EdenWorld.com. Tell them Christina sent you from uh, Deepen with Christina or the We Deepen Network. And uh, I also do some one-on-one work with couples. So if you're interested in that, feel free to reach out. Until next time, I love you. Bye.